All right, everybody. Welcome to Refuel on Wednesday night. We're glad you're here. Uh, we pray that you'll be encouraged tonight as we gather in the house. It's good to see everybody. Good for everybody to be joining us from, uh, from home or on the road or wherever you're at. Uh, just welcome. Uh, let's pray and we'll uh, give a few announcements and then we're going to sing some songs and get into the study of the book of Acts tonight. Father, we just thank you for your son, Jesus. God, we thank you that he is the beginning and the end. Lord, no matter where we're at in life, God, he's already out in front of us. And I pray, God, that we are going in the right direction, which is his direction. And so, Lord, tonight, train us in the things that we need to be trained in uh, to uh, rearrange our lives in such a way that our eyes are completely and totally fixed on his. Make us a, a people who are completely dependent on him, Lord, that we're lost in the world without him. God, help us to follow closely. I pray, God, that uh, we will be lost to the world and only found in him. That's my prayer tonight. God, uh, we just thank you that we're able to gather in this, this country. And we're free to do what we, we, uh, we, we're here to do tonight, Lord. Nobody's going to oppress us, uh, Lord. But it is a sad state, God, that uh, even though we're not facing persecution, uh, Lord, we fill our lives up with so many different things, Lord, that we keep ourselves away from the thing that we're actually uh, the most free to do. And so, Lord, we just uh, thank you for the ones that have gathered here tonight. Pray for the ones that haven't, Lord, that you'd free their lives up as well to where they could uh, worship and honor you. So, Lord, take us tonight. Open our minds. Open our eyes, God. Open our ears. Lord, mold our hearts uh, into something new and let us leave in a deeper relationship with you than we have right now. God, we give you all praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, once again, welcome. Uh, we do want to go through a few announcements. Uh, VBS is coming up July the 27th. Uh, it starts. If you haven't volunteered yet, we need some more. I know Kayla uh, has uh, several s slots that are open, but... June, I'm sorry, June 27th, uh, I said July, I think, June 27th, so that's not very far from now, but we could use some more volunteers and make sure all the children in your neighborhoods are signed up to come to Mystery Island. It's going to be great. Um, another thing that you can take time to do tonight, if you'd like, is uh, we are uh, in the building process in this building, and we do want you to go and um, Write your favorite uh, scripture verses on those uh, wooden studs in that room. Uh, we'd love for you to do that, and you can accomplish that tonight so we can build on the Word of God. Um, there are a few other things that are coming up in the month uh, as we go, but we're really focused mainly on VBS. Uh, we, you will start hearing about home groups, and we're going to have a home group fair uh, pretty soon. If you'd like to lead a group, or if you're involved in a group, and maybe we don't know about it, please let the church know uh, as we go forward. But... Uh, Things are going great. Uh, we, we, uh, we appreciate everybody's involvement and everybody's enthusiasm uh, here at New Covenant Fellowship. It really means a lot. So tonight, uh, Annette has brought her crew, and uh, they're going to uh, sing some songs as we uh, approach the throne room. So I guess uh, if you would stand, and we'll sing tonight. We are few, but we're here to sing and worship God. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. I'll be a living sanctuary for you, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Prepare 
And Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and holy tried and true with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary seated. Isn't that a beautiful thought that God chooses and purifies a, a sanctuary like our heart to dwell in? It's a beautiful thought that he would cleanse us in such a way. You know, they, if you study the Old Testament, they took precise instruction of how to purify the temple, to purify the place of God's dwelling, and God does that for us. You know, and, and how patient is he with us, you know, that he's doing it constantly and uh, purifying um, our hearts for the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. We are glad you're here. If you want to go ahead and turn over to uh, the book of Acts, we'll, we'll be in 1920 and some of 21 tonight. Um, we, we, we're, we're trudging through 
Uh, we're learning a lot. I pray that I know this has been disjointed a little bit here lately, but I hope you learned a lot about the book of Acts and the early church. That's what it's all about, is the, the, uh, the book of Acts is a telling of how the church began. And I pray that it has been enlightening to you and, and you've learned a lot. I know I've learned a lot by studying it. And uh, I hope that we can now make a difference about what we've learned. You know, learning is more than, or, or, or receiving the Word of God is much more than just hearing and knowing about it. It, it is, uh, is, is imitating it and manifesting it out into society. That's why we're studying it the way we're studying it. We're studying it as if it were a mirror. And if God did it through these ordinary people, He can surely do it through us. And I believe His heart is still to do it through us. Uh, but we need to be like them and... and, and, and Forget everything of the world, and, and our one and true purpose would be only for him. The book of Acts is uh, uh, just a, a dichotomy. of It's, it's broken up in, in many different fashions and forms. It, it seems like it has one mission to, to take the, the gospel to the world, but it's really broken up in a lot of different play, uh, parts. And the first chapter is a part into itself. Jesus is still on earth. He's, uh, he, he gives them a command, which is the, the theme or, you, or the purpose statement, if you would, of the book of Acts. Is Acts 1.8, it says, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my, my witnesses. And, uh, and that's what the, the whole book is about, is being a witness for Jesus Christ. Then he's ascended into heaven, and the disciples are awestruck. They're instructed to go back. They begin to pray in Jerusalem, and then 10 days after his ascension, the Holy Spirit falls upon them and the birth of the church. And we, we've talked about all this, how chapter 2 through 10 is, is talking about the church being established, and it's mainly dealing with the Jews. In chapter 10, Peter is called to Cornelius' house and shares the gospel, and they receive the Holy Spirit, and the Gentiles, the age of the Gentiles, if you would, then comes ushered in. The, the church age is, is really uh, on fire by this time. Uh, and then Acts chapter 11 through 28, which is where we're approaching the end of the book of Acts, is about three missionary journeys that Paul goes on. And, and it really is the rest of the book from that, from that place on is really wrapped up in these missionary journeys and how Paul is going from, from one Roman province to the other, to the other, to the other, Turkey and Greece and, and other places, and he's establishing these churches. And uh, we, are, we find ourselves now on the third missionary journey. It begins in chapter 18, and Paul is mainly the third missionary journey is taken up basically in one place, in one city, and the name of that city is Ephesus. Ephesus at that time was uh, probably the largest uh, tourist town in the world. Uh, the, uh, the temple of Diana was there, which is one of the seven wonders of the world, was still, uh, was still vibrant. Uh, the worship of a Diana was, was vibrant as well. And Paul spends three years in and around Ephesus. I, I enjoyed those studies. I learned a lot about that, how important that was. Uh, it, we know a lot of things. If you would, just turn over to Acts chapter 19 and verse 20. Uh, we know something big happened in Ephesus. A huge revival happened there. Uh, Acts 19, 20 says, So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. And so all of the temple worship, all of the witchcraft and sorcery and all the things that were going on uh, in the city of Ephesus, the word of God was prevailing on that. It was winning the hearts of others. And we know when that happens that society does not like it and a riot broke out. Uh, it was the businessmen around. We know the same thing happened in America in, in, in uh uh, before the uh, Revolutionary War in the 1740s or so, there was a huge awakening in, in the Northeast, uh, George Whitfield, um, Jonathan Edwards, and, and so many people were being saved that the tavern owners started burning churches. <laughs> uh, they started going out of business. It was really an economic depression because uh, people were coming to the church and flooding to the, uh, uh, to, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when real revival happens, it affects the atmosphere, okay? And uh, it, it, was a, it was a true revival that was happening in Ephesus. This riot takes place. Uh, we, we talk about how, how, how mobs are formed, uh, you know, I, I wrote a, uh, a, uh, I read a, a quote by Ben Franklin. Benjamin Franklin said, a mob is a monster with plenty of heads, but no brains. Okay, that's what a mob is. And, and we see a mob form in, in chapter 19. And they end up um, in the, uh, 
in the arena, if you would. They all go to one place and they really know why they're there. They're, they're just shouting about Ephesus and, and shouting about how great Diana is. Uh, it, a little later on, if you, if you look at uh, chapter 19, uh, I think it's... Uh, Oh, yeah, look at verse 34. It says, But when they recognized that he, and being, his name is Alexander, is a Jew, a single outcry from them all as they shouted for about two hours, Great is Artemis, or Diana, of the Ephesians. And for about two hours, they start chanting how great this goddess uh, with a little g, Diana, is, and how great Ephesus is. You know, for two hours. I mean, they were passionate about their faith. They were passionate about what they believed. But who knows that passion doesn't mean a hill in beans if it's not wrapped up in truth. People are are passionate about things every day of their lives. Just ask a salesman. They better be passionate about what they're selling, right? But unless it's wrapped up in truth, then it doesn't matter. Example, the temple of, of Diana, it was torn down Th- uh, over a thousand years ago, okay? The, no, it wouldn't have been a thousand years. Yes, it would have been. Over a thousand years ago. The city of Ephesus in, in Turkey does not exist anymore. And so, you see what I mean? I mean, they were very passionate about it, but only truth would prevail. Paul it was still preaching the gospel, and the gospel is still doing what? Growing and growing and growing. And Christianity is on the rise. The worship of Diana, the worship of, uh, uh, that's happening in Ephesus... remains no more so what i'm getting at is people can say that god is dead like time magazine did and people can proclaim that we're past christianity but the truth of the matter is is that there's only one thing going to remain and that's faith in jesus christ and it's only going to remain that's the only thing that's going to remain their their philosophy their psychology their their thought process for life it's going to fade away with them but the truth of christianity they can deny god all they want to You know, they can deny God all they want to, but the truth of God remains. C.S. Lewis wrote a quote. I love this. He says, a man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. Right? You can say darkness, darkness, darkness. The sun doesn't, doesn't exist anymore, but it's lunacy in the fact that what? The sun exists. And so, once again, we, you have made a good choice. <laughs> you, you serve a, a, a truth that will, never, that will never die. Christianity will never die because it doesn't matter how small the church gets, God will always have his remnant. And, uh, and so, I think this is a good lesson from chapter 19, uh, that it didn't matter what they shouted, the truth of the gospel remained. Uh, in chapter 20, We see that Paul is leaving Ephesus, and he begins to have a desire to go back to Jerusalem. And he wants to go to Jerusalem so he can worship at Pentecost. Now, one of the things that that I notice, as soon as chapter 20 hits, Paul's, either the Holy Spirit has spoken to Paul, or he knows that his life is coming to an end. I mean, he just knows it. He knows his ministry is going to be over. And he knows that he doesn't have much, much longer to, uh, to, to, to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And so his whole desire is to get back to Jerusalem. And he wants to get back to Jerusalem so that he can worship at Pentecost. Uh, we see him making his way in chapter 20. And he stops at uh, Tros. And, and he, he stays there for about seven days. And while he's there, a very good story within the book of Acts happens. Um, he begins to preach at their worship service. Uh, they were worshiping on Sundays. We talked about all that. And, and so this, this uh, chapter 20, uh, verses 7 through 12, it's about uh, them meeting on, on, on the Lord's day. They were meeting with the Lord's people. They were taking of the Lord's supper. They were sharing the Lord's message. And then they see the work of the Lord's power and his comfort. So the way the evening went was they gathered together on a Sunday evening. All right. We know it was a work day. And they gathered. And that was their that was normal time of worship. So some people say that, you know, maybe Sundays on our, on our true day of worship. It has been from the beginning. The church always met on Sundays because it was the day that that the Lord Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And so 
we, uh, we know that, that they, they did that and that, that they, they met together. They would eat together. And then they would preach a message. Somebody would share a message. And it has been from the beginning. When God's people meet, there should always be teaching or preaching that, that exhorts the people. And so Paul began to preach a message. And his message went pretty long. And we said, look, you got to give Paul a break. He knew this was the last time he was going to be able to talk to these people. And he had a lot to say. Well, during, during his message, a young man named Eutychus was trying his best after a long, hard day of work to listen. And in the, the scriptures even say that, the, that there was a lot of candles and probably a lot of heat that was in the, in the, in the room. Well, Eutychus falls asleep and falls out of the window, right? And he falls and he dies. And Paul throws himself on him and he's healed. So we see the Lord's power and his comfort uh, in chapter 20. Uh, verses 7 through 12. After that, uh, we see Paul continuing his trek back to Jerusalem. Uh, Look at chapter 20, verse 16. Paul decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now, this is very interesting. And and some people get get confused by this. Uh, during this day. So Ephesus had become one of his most important, I would say, out of all the places that he planted churches, Ephesus was probably the most important and the most successful. The, the, the uh, revival that happened in Ephesus in chapter 19 rivaled the, the thing that happened in Jerusalem. I mean, it was, a, it was an incredible revival. And so for, for Paul to say, well, I'm going to go past Ephesus He must have been in a real hurry. He knew that if he went there, he would have to stay there for a while to be able to talk to everyone. So he makes the decision, I'm going to sail right on by (laughs) and so that I can get to Pentecost. Uh, I want to worship at Pentecost. Now, I just want to talk about Pentecost for just a minute. We we talked about it at Easter, and so I'm not going to, I mean, not at Easter, uh, on Pentecost when we worshiped outdoors. And so I'm not going to talk about it a lot, but I, I do want to remind you that Pentecost was an Old Testament uh, festival, which there were three main festivals, and Pentecost was one of them. Uh, and, and so they would meet together, and, and the Jews would come from all over to, to worship at, at Pentecost. The Jews considered it a couple of things. Later in the celebration of Pentecost, it became a festival of first fruits because uh, the middle of June or, 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 or early June became a time of harvest for them. And so Pentecost became known as, as a festival of first fruits. But it was established long before that, uh, actually from the uh, exile or, or the release of the captives from Egypt. The, the way Pentecost began, it became Pentecost means 50. So what they did was when, when the children of Israel were, were, were released from Egypt uh, by the blood of the lamb, right, and they come into the wilderness, most theologians say it took them about 50 days to get to Sinai. And when they got to Sinai, what did they receive? The law written on tablets. And so Pentecost was a celebration of God writing his law for his people. And so I think Paul being a good Pharisee that he was, I know he knew all of the Old Testament uh, meaning. He knew, he knew why he was celebrating Pentecost, but I think he desired to come back to Jerusalem to, to, to worship Christ as the, as the foundation of Pentecost because Christ is the first fruits from the dead, right? Christ is the law written on our hearts. And, uh, and I believe that, that he wanted to go back and, and worship uh, in, in, so he could pay homage to what Jesus meant to him. Uh, let's continue on. So in verses 17 uh, through 21, this is where we, we stopped last time at verse 16, the last time I was able to teach. So he's saying a farewell to Ephesus. Here's what happens. From Mile- uh, Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know From the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials, which came upon me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, 
solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So I just want to stop there for a minute. So what happened was he didn't stop in Ephesus. He sailed by and he sent messengers and he said, bring the elders uh, to me in this city and I want to meet with them. And so, you know, as they were coming and making their way there, they were probably asking a lot of questions. And what do you think the main question was? Why in the world didn't Paul just stop? Does he not love us anymore? Does he not regard us as important? And so I think you can see in Paul's language that he's trying to bridge that gap. I think they completely misunderstood why Paul was in such a hurry to get back to, to Jerusalem. And, and they, were, they were sort of hurt. I mean, they had their feelings hurt. And he was trying to bridge that gap. He says, look, you know that when I was with you, I, held, I didn't hold anything back. I gave it all, all away to you. Uh, and, and he kept encouraging them. Uh, and I think there was a little misunderstanding here. He said, I didn't hold myself back. I gave myself away. I served you with tears through trials from house to house, from synagogue to synagogue, solemnly testifying, no matter the, the consequence, uh, Jesus Christ to you. And so I, I think this had, had, uh, had sort of... Um, made up for their misunderstanding a little bit, if you would. Uh, very important verses. Look at uh, Acts chapter 20, uh, starting at verse 22 through 24. So now he's, he's saying, you know, I, you know I gave myself away. Look at, look at 22. And now behold, bound by the Spirit. So now he's given a reason. This is why I didn't stop there. I'm bound by the Spirit. I'm on my way to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. You know, he knows what's going to happen when he gets there. This is a, this is a beautiful thing. He, he, he understands that he's going to have to suffer. Look at verse 24. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus uh, uh, to, to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And so now he's giving them the reason. Look, guys, the Holy Spirit is urging me to get to Jerusalem, urging me to get there. And so now I think they, he, he gives them the reason. But he's saying to them, please don't think that I'm taking the easy way out, right? I am not taking the easy way out. I'm going to suffer. The Holy Spirit is telling me that I'm going to suffer. I know that I'm going to suffer. Um, and, and wherever I go, the Spirit and others are speaking to me that I'm going to suffer. He says, but my life is not my own. It, 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 it is counted as loss. Um, he's fulfilling what we know was, was prophesied over him uh, in, in Acts chapter 9, verses 15 through 16. Remember Ananias? The, it, God says, go heal that man. Lay your hands on him and pray for him. And Ananias said, I, I don't want to go heal him. He's a persecutor of the church. And God says, oh, by the way, he's going to suffer greatly for my name. Ananias said, okay, I'll go. Just so he's going to suffer. But he did suffer greatly. And, uh, and he knows he's going to suffer more. Verse 25 through 32. And so he continues. So now he's given the reason. The Holy Spirit is urging him to go. And now, behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom, will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, the sh to, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I'm going to keep reading through 32. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own, own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, uh, remembering the day, that day, that night and day for a period of three years. I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Does this sound familiar to anybody? These words? Anybody ever read the, the book of First and Second Timothy? Anybody ever read those words? This was written during that exact time. You know who the pastor at, at Ephesus was? Timothy. 
And so if you read First and Second Timothy, you know exactly when it was written. It was written right around this time. And that's exactly what Paul was teaching Timothy. Be ready in season. Out. Watch those people. They're going to come in and try to, to, to tear down the gospel. You know, don't think that the gospel is, is, is a way to get rich, right? Keep preaching. Keep, keep, keep prospering people in the gospel. Uh, he, says, he says, first of all, he says, but I'm innocent of any man's blood, right? Once again, I just want to go back to, to being a watchman. Remember what it says in Ezekiel 33? A, a faithful watchman. If he sounds the alarm and people don't heed, then their blood is on themselves. And so Paul says, you know, I was faithful. I, I, everything that the Lord gave me, I gave to you. And so that's important to remember that he was a faithful watchman. And here he is. He says, look, guys, you're never going to see me again. You're never going to see me again. He says, uh, in verse 25, you will no longer see my face. And I know their hearts were broken, you know. But what was he doing? He was preparing others. He was raising up others to, to share the message and to, to, to preach the gospel. No, he, they wouldn't be Paul, but they were faithful uh, purveyors of the gospel. You know, and I just want to say, I, I see that. Not, not, I hope I'm not going away or that I see my end in demise. But, but I do see that happening here at New Covenant. And you're going to see some other faces up here. You know, Jed was up here a couple weeks ago and did a fantastic job. Drew Stamp is going to be up here Sunday, and he has a great message. Matter of fact, he, God gave him a... Listen how God's working in this. God gave him a message about two months... I asked him in February to consider it. And about a month after that, a month and a half after that, God gave him the message. You know what the message is? I talked to, a, I talked to the future version of you, and this is what he wants to know. And so his wife told him, he said, Pastor Lee set you up for your, your sermon. You know that. Because my sermon Sunday was, I wish someone had just told me. And so he had this message burning in his heart for almost two months now. And, and, and so my message and his message is pretty much going to go along with each other. That's just how the Lord works. You know, when I get back, uh, Joe's going to preach in here next Wednesday night. Clint Blakely is going to preach. What I'm getting at is that we need to raise up people who teach and preach and we need to be a church, listen to me well, that's not caught up on one style or, or, or one way. We need to listen for the gospel and have ears to hear. Everybody understand? I'll never forget the first revival I preached. You know, I, and, and I knew it was a, a real southern church. I mean, they did bluegrass gospel, which, I mean, it's great. I mean, I love it too, but it's, it's not my style. And I'm surely not a shouter. You know, and I went in, I started just reasoning, and, and, and about three people got up and left. And I'm like, oh, man, I was a young pastor at the time, and, and I was like, I know this isn't the style that maybe you're accustomed to. we got to get away from that church. You know, if we are lovers of Jesus Christ, it shouldn't matter about the style. We should be so in love with Jesus that if we go to a place, maybe they don't even play music. Maybe they just sing hymns. But if you're singing about Jesus, your heart should be full of music. Amen. If you go to a place and someone is, is maybe just, just standing there and reading their sermon. Did you know that Charles Spurgeon, as great of a pastor, he read every sermon that he ever preached. Did you know that? He read it. You know, and he wasn't a theatrical guy. But man, he had some great things to say. And so what I'm getting at is we should be a church not caught up in form or caught up in a certain style. We should be a group of people who love Jesus so much that if his name is mentioned, I'm going to find him there. You know, I always say... That when I was younger, uh, my dad, I'll never forget this, he had a very, uh, a very uh, uh, recognizable laugh. I'll just put it that way. You, I could hear his laugh anywhere. And I, I remember one time we were, we were on the pier fishing, and he was at the very end, and I had gone inside. And, and as soon as I came out of the doors, I was only seven or eight years old. I could hear my dad laughing over all the other people because I knew my dad's voice. I knew his laugh. I knew how he spoke. If we... Get to know the voice of our, our, our Savior, uh, and He's our friend, then it doesn't matter what everybody else is saying. When we hear Him speak, we should be able to find Him, right? And th that's the type of church that I want us to be. I, I want us to be a church that, that is just looking for our Savior, no matter who's talking about Him or how they're presenting it. And I just, I just pray that, that, that we'll be that type. We, we can change the world, we can change that old, old uh, traditionalism. And, and, and really, you know, dig into uh, to, to really growing up a next age of church if, we, if we'll be that way. So Paul is preparing these new ministers. 
He's saying, look, your churches are never going to see my face again. I know I was the one who planted all these churches, but you're never going to see me again. And uh, I know they were, they were taking the brevity of it. And isn't it just beautiful to think that Timothy was sitting there and he was, he was taking all this in uh, as, as, as Paul was getting ready to go. Look at verses uh, 33 through 35. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these, these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help, help the weak and remember the words of the Lord that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So, so he's warning these new pastors. He says, look, don't see ministry as some kind of lucrative gain. He says, you know how I ministered to you. He said, I worked with my hands. I, I, I took care of my own. And he warns Timothy, look, I know, that, I know he wrote it at the same time. Look what it says in 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 through 10. This sounds just like what he's writing right now in, in Acts chapter 20. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. Sounds like a wolf, right? And, and, and he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out, out of which arise envy and strife and abusive language, evil suspicions and constant friction between men of deprived, depraved mind and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness actually is a means of gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. Some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I mean, I can, see, I can see Paul meeting with this group and then writing this letter to Timothy on the same day. That's exactly what he's talking about. So they sum up, some people were trying to seize the opportunity and make money off the gospel. And unfortunately, we see that today. You know, it's, it's, still, it's still true today. Verse 36 through 38. When he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud and braced Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken that they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. You know, this is, this is a great picture of a faith family, you know, and, and how we get interconnected, isn't it? You know, when, when people leave or when people, we were just talking about some, some of the military families, I know Boomer and I were talking about it, that are leaving. You know, our hearts are heavy that we're losing people, that, that, we have, that we have grown to love. And, and so that's what a faith family does. God brings us into a family, you know. It says in Ephesians uh, 12, let's just read that in chapter 2 of Ephesians. Uh, God's Word tells us some of my favorite verses uh, that, that really speak to the heart of, of what we are and, and what we've become. Uh, Ephesians 2, uh, 12, uh, let's read 12 through 12 and 13. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, contextually, he was writing to the Gentiles, trying to, at, 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 at the Ephesus church, trying to combine and, and uh, bring unity between the Jews and the Gentiles. And so the same that he did in the book of Romans, he does in the book of Ephesians. The book of Romans, if you read it for what it is, there's a lot of, I feel like, stretching man's doctrine out of the book of Romans. The book of Romans and the book of Ephesians is trying to bring two camps within the same church together. And the book of Romans and, and the book of Ephesians is about bringing the Gentiles and the Jews and combining them into the world, one, one church. So there is no longer any Gentiles and Jews. There's only sons and daughters of God. And so he says, remember Gentiles when you were far off. But this also speaks to the heart of every individual, right? I mean, this speaks directly to us. Remember at that time. I remember so well before I was saved. I mean, sometimes I want to forget some of the thoughts I had, but I think it keeps me grounded and so thankful you know, I, I, thank, I thank Christ 
every day for coming into my life and revealing a new, a, a new vision for, for, li- for life itself. I mean, for living life in a different way, for, for, for not looking at success the way I used to. Success, it's like we talked about Sunday, it has nothing to do with money. Success is how many people's lives you touch and how many, how many, how many people come to a newness of life themselves. That's what life is. And, and I, I remember so much about the selfish desires, and, and, and I still have to battle with that, but God has done a transformation in my life. And, and I remember when I was without Christ and without hope in the world, and these verses just, they just ring so true to me. So I, it was written contextually to the, to the Gentiles, but it's also written to each one of us. It's a love letter to our heart. Just remember, remember that time and be grateful. And then verse 19 says to us, so then to the Gentiles, you're no longer strangers and aliens. And also to us, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, a part of his family. And so that's what God forms is a family. So chapter 20, uh, 20 ends with the, the goodbyes to the elders and the new pastors and, and leaders at Ephesus. And now he boards a ship. Now, it becomes interesting now. So Paul is sort of, He's very wise. I think the Holy Spirit leads him and gives him a lot of logic. Paul has been through a lot of troubles, right? Everywhere he goes, the Judaizers and the Jews cause riots. Everywhere he goes, we know that, that the Roman, even the Roman Empire knows that this is a problem. And because of the troubles, Paul and his associates uh, had undergone, Paul decides instead of taking one trip where there could be enemies that might murder him from one trip from, uh, from, this, from this town straight to, to, uh, to Syria or, or to, um, to Samaria area so they can, they can go to Jerusalem. He decides to do like an Amtrak, uh, an Amtrak trip, like from stop to stop to stop to stop to stop. And that's how he sails back 400 miles, but he goes to... One small town after another, port town to mort town to port town. The best thing I can, I can compare it to is an Amtrak train, just going from one place to the next place to the next place, making his way back to Jerusalem. Look at Acts chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. When we had parted from there, uh, from them and set sail, we ran a straight course to, to Kos and the next day to Rhodes and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. Let, let me just stop for a minute because I'm having this thought. The corset is here. He gave me and Joe a lesson in Hebrew the other day. And uh, I'm a little uh, intimidated with him sitting in here tonight. Where are you at, Doug? I saw you earlier. Look at him laughing at me. He wants to get up here and say all these names properly. And I, <laughs> I hear you. Just get with me afterwards. Uh, <laughs> when we came inside of Cyprus... Leaving it on the left, we kept sailing to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was, uh, was to unload its cargo. See, from town to town to port to port. And now they have to stop at Tyre because that's where they were meant to go and they had to unload the ship. After looking up the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. They kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. When our days there were, were ended, we left and started on our journey while they all, with wives and children, escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down once again on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home again. So let's just break this down a little bit. This was the first recorded stop in, in, the, in the city, in the port city of Tyre. Uh, the church was established. It must not have been a very big church because they had to do what? Go search out where the disciples were at. But the church was established. Did you know that the church was established in many cities that Paul didn't go to? Anybody want to guess why? How would the church get planted if if an apostle didn't plant it? The day of Pentecost, right? The day of Pentecost. Think of all the nations that were there. Think of all the people that were there. And they receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what? The one who guides us to the truth. And so they went from there. The the church in Rome, right? Paul writes to the church in Rome. Who planted it? Nobody knows. 
We know the church was thriving. We know the church was doing well. But nobody knows who planted it. So I, I say the day of Pentecost planted it. When, when the Holy Spirit started filling people who lived in Rome or moved to Rome, they felt an urging, they felt a need to worship with other believers. And so that is, the, that is the, the, the way that the church begins. Entire, nobody, had, Paul had never been there. But he seeks out the disciples. The church was established. And he goes and he finds the followers. Um, and, 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 uh, and he begins to minister to them. At the end of Paul's final uh, missionary journey, he develops this, this strong love for the Jews. I just want to throw this in here before, before we end tonight. And so all of these little stops that he was going to, he was taking up an offering every time. And we know this from the book of uh, uh, Romans and the book of 2 Corinthians. And once, the beauty of the book of Acts is that Paul is writing to and exhorting and, and, and encouraging all of, these, uh, all of these churches that he planted. Look at Romans chapter 15. Uh, Romans 15, and, and I'll just, um, I, I want to set what, what I said. I want to back it up with Scripture, that he was taking up an offering. He says, he says to the church in Rome, But now I am going to Jerusalem, uh, serving the saints, for Macedonia and Achaia, which is in the area he's at, in now, have been, have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so, and they are indebted to them, for if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual for if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. And so Paul was doing something, and, and I just want to present something. He was doing it on purpose. Look at 2 Corinthians, uh, once again, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter uh, 9, verses 10 through 15. Is that right? Yeah, 12, I'm sorry, 12 through 15. For the ministry of this service, he's talking about this offering, is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God because of the proof given by this ministry, and he's talking about this offering. They will glorify God for your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all, while they also, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So I just, this is sort of a, a sideline. We're not told in the book of Acts that Paul has taken up this offering for the Jews, which, by the way, there was a famine going on in Jerusalem. He, did, he doesn't say in the book of Acts, but this is going on. Everywhere he goes, there's being an offering taken up, and they're taking it back to Jerusalem. Why? Why take an offering? All of Paul's problems, all of them, have come from the Jews and the Judaizers. You remember back in chapter 15 where they go to Jerusalem and Paul is telling about all the great things that happened on the third, uh, second missionary journey? And the Judaizers say, oh, by the way, for them to be saved, they have to be circumcised. Remember that? Big debate came up over it. And they finally came up with this, this, uh, this plan that, no, they don't have to be circumcised, but yes, they can't eat red meat. You know, they can't eat the blood out of animals and things. Remember those, those letters? They came to a compromise. But the Judaizers were chasing him all over the place, and they were at the base of a lot of these riots. And it was bad news. I mean, there's bad blood between all of them. And Paul was taking up this offering to hopefully... Bring unity within the body and an appreciation. The Jews appreciating the Gentiles and the Gentiles realizing why they should appreciate the Jews. And unity is something you have to fight for. Unity is something that we have to go out of the box for. And Paul was fighting for it. Um, these followers fall in love with Paul in one week. And, 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 and they, are, they are so uh, heartbroken to lose him. Um, they warned him about the persecution and the perils that might happen to him uh, in J Jerusalem. But his love for the, for, for the Jews and the love for Jerusalem and the, 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 uh, the urging to worship at Pentecost was evident in his life. He wasn't afraid to give up his life. He knew that whatever would happen there would be because of God willed it. Okay? It's... it's uh, 
It's a beautiful thing. In Psalm 91, I, I think about this often. It was a, something that uh, when the pandemic happened last year, it was something I just grabbed a hold to, and I, I think I kept it in my pocket all the time uh, because you just don't know what's going to happen. Um, but uh, this is what God's Word says about those who trust in the Lord. doesn't mean that if you die of something that the Lord doesn't love you. It's just for the believer. We should trust in the Lord. We should trust in the Lord with everything. We should trust in the Lord when we die. That that was his appointed time for us. It says in Psalm 91, He who dwells in the shadow of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you may take refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day or of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague Come near your tent, for he will give you his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. Psalm 91 is a great uh, psalm, uh, and Paul knew it very well. He was probably singing it in the middle of the night, knowing that he was probably going to his destruction. They follow Paul out of town. They kneel and they pray and before he leaves. And the Spirit is causing a sense of finality. Once again, I think Paul has come to this realization, too, that not only is it he might not be able to travel there again. I think he realized that the end of his life is pretty near and that uh, he's going, he doesn't know how, but he knows he's going to, to probably, uh, his life is probably going to end sooner than later. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses uh, 15 through 16, it says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So, so then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, some would look at Paul and say, man, you're full of pride for what you're doing. Because all of these people are telling you not to go back to Jerusalem. And so, that's one way of looking at it, right? Is that Paul is full of pride and he's, you know, damn the torpedoes. It doesn't matter to me. I'm going to do what I feel like the Lord is leading me to do. And some people say, you know, that's, that's prideful. And we can become prideful that way. And we can become pig-headed, right? We can, we can set, our, set our mind uh, uh, forward like we're, we'll never turn back. But I don't think that was Paul at all. I think Paul was just a courageous man. I, I think Paul basically knew. I mean, there, every town he went to, they said, don't go back. Don't go back. Don't go back. And uh, I think that's important to understand. Uh, let's continue verses 7 through 14. On the first day of, oops, one chapter too far back. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at, ooh, that's, and I'm not going to say that word. And after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea. Now, that was a familiar name, right? Caesarea. We, we know we're getting close. We're getting back toward the region of Judea. Uh, they went to Caesarea. And entering the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. As we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the, the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns his belt and deliver him to the hands of the Gentiles. When we had heard this as well as the local residents, we began begging Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking, the will of the Lord be done. You know, once again, some would say, hey, man, Paul's just being pigheaded. But some would say, man, he's very courageous because he knows what's happening. I falter on the side of him being very courageous uh, and willing to die for his faith. Philip, this is an interesting encounter, right? What do we know about Philip? He was one of the original, right? The original seven. Who else was one of the original seven? 
Stephen. Do you remember who was the gang leader when Stephen got stoned to death? His name was Saul at the time. Now we know him as Paul. Don't you think that was sort of interesting? Here comes Paul back into the house of Philip, whose best friend might have been Stephen. I think that could have been a a very interesting interaction there. Um, And then what did we say about Philip? I mean, what did we say about Stephen? When Stephen was was martyred and and Paul was there, we say that that Paul sort of took on the ministry of Stephen. Remember those those when we were talking about that? That that Paul sort of took that mantle and he was going to suffer uh, because of uh, of of what had happened with Stephen. And 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 so this is this was no small offense that that he had been a part of this. And I just think it was very interesting that that Philip was able to embrace him and bring him in his house. Do you know? If you've had people to offend you in the past, the Lord is able to, to, to put a good healing over that scar. Did you know that? Just trust in the Lord. You know, I, I talked to somebody this week, and they were sort of dreading going to a, uh, this thing that happened. And it was no small thing. You know, I said, just, let's just pray and trust the Holy Spirit. I, I felt like in my heart it was going to work out, and it did. It worked out okay. Um, we should let things just fester and fester and fester. And so it, this just, just shows the, the, uh, the integrity of Philip. It shows that, that he had grown in the Lord and was not holding on to old, old things. He didn't have any unforgiveness in his heart. Uh, a couple of things that I just want to, before we stop. Uh, Philip had four virgin daughters who were all prophetesses. Now, it doesn't say another word about this. So I don't know what the emphasis was other than to teach us that that obviously Philip had led a faithful life throughout his whole life. His daughters were now following sort of in his footsteps. They were faithful people. The family was a faithful family because there was no other reason that we would be told that they, they were prophetesses uh, at this time. Let's talk about Agabus. Agabus was from Judea. He was a prophet. He comes in and in dramatic fashion, right, he walks in. We don't even know if he says anything. He walks in. He grabs Paul's belt, and he begins to do what? Tie up his own hands and feet. You know, it sort of reminds you of, of Ezekiel uh, being so dramatic in his sermons. And, and, and um, so, so he just binds himself up, and he says, look at me. This is what they're going to do to you. <laughs> this is what's going to happen to you if you go to Jerusalem. And uh, so this was a dramatic uh, telling of what was going to happen. Look at verse 13. Paul says, what are you doing? (laughs) You're weeping and you're breaking my heart. I'm not ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we fell silent, remarking the will of the Lord. First of all, I see a lot of respect here. You know, they they said, okay, you know, he's the leader. Uh, He he knows what's coming. Um. I believe that this does show that, that he was a, uh, a very courageous, courageous man. I'm going to stop there uh, because the next verse is he gets back to Jerusalem. Uh, and we're going to talk about how that uh, he hadn't been there in 11 years, you know. I mean, 11 years since he had been to Jerusalem. And uh, I'm sure there was a lot of changes. The church in Jerusalem had actually had become less and less. Um, Jesus' brother James is now. The, 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 uh, the leader at the church in Jerusalem. And uh, we're going to see some interesting things happen next time. Uh, I appreciate y'all coming tonight. Uh, it will probably be a, a couple weeks because we have, uh, it's probably going to be several weeks. We'll get back into it in July sometime, but, but just hold your place. Go ahead and read. Allow the Holy Spirit to teach you some stuff, but we will finish the book of Acts one day, okay? One day. Uh, we did pretty good tonight. We got through quite a bit. Uh, Hey, does anybody have anyone to like to pray for? If you do, just raise your hand tonight. Anybody, any, anything hurt in your heart? Let's pray. Father, with, with uh, outstretched hands and raised arms, Lord, uh, we pray for others. God, we, we lift up those who are hurting. God, I can think of many right now, Lord, that are in the middle of grief. Lord, and it seems, death never seems fair. <laughs> I'll just put it that way, Lord. I guess that's why he says the ultimate enemy. Uh, but, Lord, I just, I just pray for those who are grieving. I pray for those who are sick. I pray, God, that you'd restore them. I pray, God, for marriages, Lord, that may be on shaky ground, Lord. I pray for faithfulness. I pray for for perseverance. I just pray, God, that you would 
uh, bind the hearts of the, of the husband and the wife together. I, I pray for the, the students, Lord. Uh, I know there's a lot of them in summer school right now. I pray for all these kids that are going to summer school, God, that you would just cover their hearts and their minds. And, and Lord, I pray for our camp here at New Covenant, Lord, with all these children traveling almost every day. God, hedge all of our vans with your, your angels, God. Such precious cargo in each one of them. And I, I just pray, God, protection over them. Lord, there's so many things being represented tonight by these hands. I just pray, God, that you, Lord, would be Lord over all and that you would receive all the glory. We thank you for this time together. We thank you, God, for each person in this room. I pray, God, that you would make them world changers, Lord. No matter where they're at, Lord, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that, uh, that we can't do small things for others, Lord. Uh, Lord, we can be mission-minded wherever we go. I just ask, God, that you would help us to just, just, just be a missionary to that one tomorrow. Lord, just one person. Let, let us do that. Give us that opportunity, God, and we'll be faithful to step in that door. Lord, we just thank you for all things, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming tonight. God bless you.